First, let's define exactly what the difference is between compound versus isolation lifts. Isolation lifts, by definition, are exercises which only involve movement from a single joint at any given time. In reality, other joints will inevitably move to some extent. It is almost impossible to keep your entire body stationary apart from a single joint moving. However, in a practical sense, we can define isolation lifts as movements coming primarily from a single joint. Some examples of isolation lifts include bicep curls, lateral raises, leg extensions, and calf raises. On the other hand, compound lifts, by definition, are exercises which involve movement at more than one joint simultaneously. Again, you could argue that even when performing isolation lifts, any slight movement at another joint could technically be considered a compound lift. But in a practical sense, compound lifts can be thought of as exercises when there are two or more joints primarily involved to produce force. Some examples of compound lifts include any form of chest press, rows, squats, or deadlifts. Before comparing the effects of compound versus isolation lifts on muscle growth, we first need to establish an important principle, the concept of muscle stress. Muscle growth occurs as a result of resistance training, which induces stress to a muscle, which results in muscle growth as an adaptation. The tissues don't know and don't care whether the exercise was a compound or isolation lift, they only recognize stress and adapt accordingly. So essentially, the goal for hypertrophy training is to maximally stress the muscle we are trying to target with a particular exercise. And how we achieve this is by ensuring the target muscle is the limiting factor of each set. In other words, if we were to take a set to failure, fatigue of the target muscle should be the factor which hits failure first, not any other muscles and not the cardiorespiratory system. The limiting factor can be influenced and changed via manipulation of many variables, such as technique and rest periods, but exercise selection also plays a major role. Keeping this idea in mind, let's now discuss how compound and isolation lifts influence muscle growth. The most comprehensive study we have on this topic is this paper which compared training with isolation versus compound lifts on muscle growth in trained women. Trainees were split into three different groups, who all trained two times per week for 24 weeks, with all sets taken to failure. One group performed only compound lifts, such as squats, deadlifts, bench press, and rows. The second group performed only isolation lifts, such as leg extensions, leg curls, chest flies, and bicep curls. And the third group performed a combination of compound and isolation lifts, including squats, leg curls, bench press, and bicep curls. At the end of the 24-week study, changes in muscle thickness were different between groups for each muscle. For example, the compound-only group saw the most growth of the quads and glutes, whereas the isolation-only group saw the most growth of the triceps and biceps. And these results are probably what you would expect based on the training protocols. As we can see, the compound-only group included more effective quad and glute training via squats, leg press, lunges, and deadlifts. Whereas the isolation-only group only included quad and glute training via leg extensions, hip thrusts, and hip extensions. Alternatively, the isolation group included more direct arm training via the tricep pushdowns and bicep curl variations, whereas the compound-only group had no direct arm training, only indirect training. So I think what we can see here is that neither exercise type is inherently better for muscle growth in all cases. Rather, it depends on which exercise trains which muscle, and how much total weekly volume is allocated to each muscle group. Although, to decide on which exercises to implement into a training program, there are a few additional considerations that should be made. The first and most important consideration is what muscle is the limiting factor of the exercise. For isolation lifts, there is usually only one primary muscle that is involved in the lift so that muscle is maximally stressed. With compound lifts, there are multiple muscle groups involved in the exercise, but usually only one muscle limits performance and is maximally stressed. For example, this study compared the effects of compound versus isolation lifts on biceps growth. Trainees performed four to six sets of eight to 12 reps of dumbbell curls for one arm and dumbbell rows for the other arm. And as we can see, the arm-performing curls resulted in superior biceps growth, as shown in the blue bar, 
compared with the arm performing dumbbell rows shown in the orange bar, although the biceps still saw some hypertrophy from the rows alone. This is likely because curls involve the biceps as the limiting muscle, which means they experience the most adaptation. Whereas rows do involve the biceps to some extent, but they aren't maximally stressed because they aren't the limiting muscle. Instead, the back muscles are. So it is important to ensure that the exercise you implement maximally stresses the target muscle by ensuring it is the limiting factor of each set. However, this concept also goes the other way. This is via the effects of indirect muscle growth of accessory muscles. While we want each exercise to maximally stress a specific muscle group, other muscles will still be involved to some extent with compound lifts. This means accessory muscles may see some amount of muscle growth, even if it is not maximal. For example, let's look at this study which explored muscle activation of the delts across various different exercises. Trainees performed a 10RM set of multiple different upper body exercises, and muscle activation of the different regions of the deltoid were recorded. If we take a look at this graph of rear deltoid muscle activation, we can see that the reverse pec deck resulted in the greatest activity, which is expected since it is a direct rear delt exercise. However, indirect exercises like the lat pulldown and seated row also resulted in quite high activation of the rear delts, even though this isn't really the target muscle of the movement. Although this study didn't directly measure muscle growth, it suggests that compound lifts will likely provide somewhat of a stimulus for other accessory muscles too. This would then likely translate to some amount of muscle growth from long-term training. This can be beneficial as it will make our training protocol more efficient compared with performing all isolation lifts. This is something we will touch on in more detail later in this video. Another consideration regarding compound versus isolation lifts is what regions of a muscle are trained via each specific exercise. Different exercises will usually bias certain portions of a muscle group. So even if an exercise trains a muscle group, it may not train each portion of the muscle equally. Therefore, it may be beneficial to preference either compound or isolation lifts based on which muscles are biased. An example of this is the quadriceps muscle group. There are four quad muscles, the vastus lateralis, the vastus medialis, the vastus intermedius, and on top sits the rectus femoris. If we take the rectus femoris away, we can see that the three vasti muscles originate on the femur. However, the rectus femoris originates on the pelvis, meaning that it crosses the hip joint and is involved in moving the hips. This means the role of the vasti muscles is purely knee extension, but the rectus femoris also performs hip flexion. This relates back to compound versus isolation lifts, as all quad muscles aren't going to be maximally trained with all exercises. Squat variations will train the vasti muscles, but the rectus femoris won't be maximally recruited since squats involve two opposing actions for this muscle. However, the rectus femoris will be better trained with something like leg extensions where the hips don't move. So even though compound lifts like squats are a great exercise to train most muscle groups, we might not be developing all regions of that muscle group by not including specific isolation movements. And there are numerous other examples of exercises which may not fully train all portions of a muscle group. Furthermore, it is also important to consider the indirect effects of compound versus isolation lifts. Each exercise type may have unique benefits which can indirectly promote a superior or inferior hypertrophic stimulus. The first indirect effect is something we alluded to earlier, and that is time efficiency. This is probably a unanimous win for compound lifts. This is because compounds train more muscle groups simultaneously, meaning we will probably achieve superior overall muscle growth on a per set basis. However, like we discussed, only one muscle group will be the true limiting factor of each set, while the accessory muscles will receive a lesser stimulus. However, even this small stimulus means we may not need to allocate as much volume to some muscle groups since they already get some stimulus from the compound lifts. A common example of this is the front delts, which get trained quite heavily via compound pressing movements. So in most cases, many lifters may not need to train the front delts with much, if any, direct work at all. 
The next indirect factor to consider is the influence of compound versus isolation lifts on fatigue. For this discussion, isolation lifts are probably the winner here. Isolation lifts are usually less fatiguing from both a physiological and psychological standpoint. This is because isolation lifts involve fewer muscles, lighter loads are used, there are lower technical demands, lower cardiorespiratory demands, and they usually require less mental effort to perform. This can make isolation lifts more conducive to a training routine in many cases. It will be very fatiguing if we only perform compound lifts for our entire workout routine throughout the week. Rather, we can probably get through our training with less physiological and psychological fatigue by including some isolation lifts. This leads us on to the last indirect effect, which is the influence of compound versus isolation lifts on joint stress. This refers to pain or irritation of the joints and connective tissue involved in the lift. This isn't really a discussion regarding compound versus isolation lifts, rather it is unique to the specific exercise and the specific lifter. Some people simply find that certain movements induce more joint stress than others, regardless of whether they are compound or isolation lifts. However, I would say that, in general, most people would tend to find that compound lifts are slightly more stressful on the joints compared with isolation lifts. Although, more importantly, we can select compound or isolation lifts based on our individual joint tolerance. For example, let's say a trainee cannot perform squats due to a lower back issue. Instead, they can perform isolation lifts covering the muscles which were trained via squats, namely the quads and glutes. So in this case, the lifter may replace squats with leg extensions to hit the quads and a hip extension variation to hit the glutes, at least until they can get back to squats. Yes, this is less efficient, but it is a good way to work around joint pain or injury. Taking all of this information into consideration, let's now explore some practical recommendations. Firstly, neither compound or isolation lifts are inherently better in all cases. Rather, it comes down to which muscles are being maximally stressed and limit performance. Both exercise types can be highly effective at promoting muscle growth. However, there are a few unique benefits that each exercise type may have over the other. Compound lifts usually train more muscles than isolation lifts, which promotes development of accessory muscles. This can make our training sessions more time efficient, since we are hitting more overall musculature with each set. Isolation lifts, on the other hand, tend to hit a muscle group in their entirety, as opposed to compound lifts which may not maximally stress certain portions. Furthermore, isolation lifts are usually less centrally fatiguing, and they are usually less stressful on the joints and connective tissue. So from a practical perspective, a combination of both compound and isolation lifts is probably the best option for most lifters who want to maximize muscle growth. They each have their own unique benefits, and should supplement each other. Furthermore, each trainee should preference each exercise type based on their individual context. If you want to get the most stimulus in a short amount of time, then it may be a good idea to include more compound lifts. If you want to get the best stimulus with the least fatigue and joint stress, then it may be best to include more isolation lifts. Trainees can use these principles to make their own informed decisions. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.